Morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Let me make sure this, sure this is working. Um, so when Marlena asked me, you know, can you speak at this conference? I was like, I was very excited, and I was like, how long do I have? And the reason I asked is because there's a lot to cover when it looks when you look at stormwater as it relates to a project. And so I wanted to provide some of that outside perspective that I have working with central federal lands. I know it's a that's a mouthful of a division, but it's because we get a unique opportunity in my office. So today, I, like Marlene said, I'm gonna talk about stormwater considerations in the two broad categories. The project development side, which I feel like gets left out a lot. A lot of times people are, well, is it a silt fence or is it a waddle? What do I need? There's a whole design aspect that's really important to the process that I, I wanna focus on and provide some Colorado examples. And then we'll hit on the construction side of things for the breakouts, right? So first of all, who am I? I work for Central Federal Lands Highway. We're way out there in Lakewood, Colorado. And we cover a 14 state region. So we work with federal land management agencies like the Park Service, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, as, as well as counties, local DOTs, et cetera. So we have a broad suite of partners on our projects. And as such, we cover a lot of regulatory boundaries. We have 10 Army Corps regulatory districts as well as uh, state equivalents for 401 certifications. We also work under 15 different construction general permits, including the EPA and state specific. So in, in our role, we have to maintain compliance when we're out in the Arizona desert, you know, the windward side of the Big Island, et cetera. So we, we cover that large range of conditions. But I'd like to start here. Why is clean water important? And I think everyone could come up with uh, hundreds of answers to this, right? It is the water planet, 70% of the surface is covered in water, so how we affect that affects everyone's quality of life, right? So we all need clean water. But a lot of us aren't thinking about the quality of the water that's in our coffee cups right now, or the water that we're drinking, or the food that was prepared in it this morning. It's because it's easy to expect it to be clean and managed in the right way in, in our modern society. But it can happen, it can, things can change very quickly. I'll give you an example of Puerto Rico. In 2016, they had a groundwater contaminated site that was designated a Superfund site. Post the Hurricane Maria impacts, they had to tap into that groundwater well to supply drinking water to residents on the island. That's a pretty scary fact to think about drinking water coming from a Superfund site because all other sources became, became more contaminated, right? It happens very quickly. But when people think about water quality, you have this water cycle that kind of overwhelms you because of this landscape level process. So how do we manage that? We break it down into smaller, more manageable segments, right? Watersheds. And this is where we typically focus our efforts when we're looking at how we're working within a, an area is the watershed approach. Watersheds function very naturally and very dynamically depending on the amount of precipitation and the, the climatic zone that they're in. But there's these standard zones that occur within these watersheds with your headwater zone, your transitional zone, and then more importantly, your depositional zone. And I'll point out the depositional zone is this meandering convergent point for all the water within that watershed. And that is exactly where we like to build this, right in the most dynamic zone of the watershed it's flat, it's buildable land, and we put development in, that, in its place, right? This is what that looks like on a, kind of a map view, and you'll notice in several areas, you might not be able to see the pointer, like Alawai, there, there's several areas where we have 90 degree turns within a river. I don't know how much you know about rivers, but they don't like 90 degree turns, right? And so they're prone to jump their banks, they're prone to flooding at those areas, because naturally they would have been that dynamic in those zones, right? But stormwater is natural. A lot of people say, well, stormwater is natural. It occurs, but we have to look at it from our disciplines because we have a direct effect of how that stormwater flows across the landscape. All of the impervious surfaces that we are putting within that watershed are increasing the volume and velocity and even temperature of the water flowing across that landscape. So now we have to manage that changed 
hydro modification of that watershed. And by definition, hydro modification is a change of watershed processes. And that's why I bring that up is because a lot of people talk about just their project. And you've got to think bigger. You've got to look up from your project and understand where you lie within that larger context. Because here's a perfect example. A natural area, 10% runoff. Highly urban area, 55% runoff. What are you going to do with that five-fold increase in runoff that would typically slow down and filter into the ground that's now flowing through your project area? Well, when you put that much water down channels, you're affecting this. Lane's balance is an understanding that stable rivers maintain their dimensions while flowing debris, um, water, sediment, et cetera, without drastic changes in a natural system. But when you put a five-fold increase in water, what did you do? You tipped that scale. You put a lot of water. You didn't change the sediment size in that drainage or anything. And so what happens? Degradation occurs. You start eroding stream banks. You start having head cuts, et cetera. How do we counter that? We just throw rock at it. We put riprap. We increase the sediment size in that drainage to try to balance the scales. But there's a better way of handling it than on this case-by-case -case basis um, that we typically do. Right? What's the second reason we concern, we're concerned with stormwater? Pollution. As it's flowing across these landscapes, it's picking up everything in its path and it's transporting them to the nearest receiving water. And off of transportation, that's, there's heavy metals, there's volatile organic compounds, there's trash, there's all of those things that are flushing through because of our facility that end up in our receiving waters, right? Stormwater is the leading cause of pollution in the United States. 40% of the rivers in the United States are too polluted for fishing, swimming, or aquatic life. And in 2014, DOH did assessments of only 28% of nearshore marine waters, and 85% of those did not meet state water quality standards. Those are pretty staggering statistics to me. When you see the, that level of pollution, and um, especially when Water is the lifeblood of these islands, right? So surface water provides 50% of the irrigation water in this uh, state of Hawaii. And the main issues with surface water are stream flow availability, reduction of stream flow from diversions and use, um, water quality changes, floods, and uh, erosion and sediment transport. And natural channel design and an understanding of natural channel just cha channels can address most of those issues. So it's important to understand that. And then groundwater. 99% of the drinking water in the state comes from groundwater. So when you're at risk of contamination of those groundwater supplies, which you are, Oahu detection rates in groundwater of VOCs, fumigants, solvents, are the highest in the nation. And it's because of how these volcanic basalt aquifers function. Things filter into the ground a lot better than they do in some of the granite mountains of Colorado. So that's an important understanding of the pollution that's in your state ha ends up into these groundwater supplies, right? So the major influence of water quality, right? Contaminants, pesticides and nutrients, and then degraded stream habitat. And it's important to understand degraded stream habitat and wetlands, et cetera, because they provide such a, a large function that I'll get into. Um, but this is where the Clean Water Act comes in. This, was, this is its intent. Restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. It wanted to eliminate the discharge of pollutants into the nation's waters. Its target was 1985. We're a bit late. Um, and it wanted to achieve water quality levels that were fishable and swimmable. Those are standards that I think most of us could support. Um, but most of us, when we deal with Clean Water Act compliance, we're only in these, these highlighted areas. We deal with the Section 401 water quality certification, you know, the NPDES component of 402, and then discharge of dredge and fill under 404. But everybody has a role to play. We mostly think, well, it's a, we just need our permit. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a right, it's a privilege. And so we have in our own regulations at Federal Highway, um, to make sure that we are complying, right? So our mission statement is to bring innovation into transportation sector. And then I looked at the, DO, the Hawaii DOT's mission statement, right? It wants sustainable 
transportation that preserves economic prosperity and quality of life. But when you look at those, that mission statement, water quality affects those, right? If you lose access to good water quality, right? And here's where our regulations talk about it, right? Minimize erosion and sediment damage and pollution to water resources. Make sure we manage short and long-term impacts to wetlands and natural functions. These are out of CFLs or the Federal Highways 23 CFR. And why do we care, right? Well, on average, since 1780, the, con the mainland of the United States has lost 60 acres of wetland every hour to the reduction of 52% of the wetland sites that were originally within the United States. Hawaii's lost on average 12% uh, of its wetland sites, about 7,000 acres. And when you think about what those wetlands were doing as far as a service, that's why we construct wetlands when we're managing stormwater, because they provide functions and values that help us manage pollution. That's a large service that's been lost that we now have to make up somewhere, right? So these functions, obviously a lot of habitat that they're provided, they're hubs of biodiversity, wetlands in riparian areas. Um, there's a lot of hydro hydro hydrologic functions, right? So they slow the velocity of water, they groundwater recharge areas but they also filter out pollution and trap sediment, right? And as part of those internal features that are part of wetlands, they have a lot of external values, right? They're recreational areas, they're hunting areas, uh, crop production areas, right? But this is where you care about, right? How does it apply to your project? I'm in project development, and I want to know what that means to me, right? Well, it starts here. This is a, a cheat, li cheat list for when you're looking at a project development, one, you've got to have a collaborative team that involves engineers as well as environmental specialists and stormwater experts. And then you look at your site. What are we doing? What is our goal of this project? And consider where it is within that watershed, the, the surrounding sites. And you start looking for those opportunities on how can we protect these valuable site features, these wetlands, these waters of the U.S., et cetera, which we're required to do under the Clean Water Act, right? Least environmentally damaging practicable alternative. We're looking at for those options when we have a project, right? Because if we don't, this is the risk. We have a system out of balance. We have all this water, all this volume and velocity, and what are we going to do with it? Well, this is the standard approach. We take a design flow event, we put a nice engineered trapezoidal channel, and what does it do? It does a good job at moving water through the system very quickly, but at the detriment of all the other functions that a natural stream system would have, right? It's one size fits all. Streams are not one size fits all. They flow at varying levels throughout the year. It also interrupts the stream processes of aquatic habitat that would exist within there. There's no infiltration from the stream bed or stream banks, both in and out. Right? So you're losing that base flow capacity that water would feed back into the stream. You've got that habitat loss, and now you're quickly transmitting all the pollutants that that water has intercepted straight to your receiving water. Right? It's everywhere. We see that a lot. These are examples. And, I, you know, it's good at conveying water very quickly and obviously skate, skateboarding. Um, <laughs> but that's about it. And this is what I'm proposing, is you've got to look at it and work with these natural systems, these natural river systems. And I have an example from Colorado that I'll bring up here for But rivers have a low flow channel. They have a bank full channel. They have that flood prone area. And they have these natural patterns and profiles that we have to be re respectful of when we look at our development. Because water has one thing that we all wish we had more of. That's time. <laughs> and it doesn't like being told what to do. Right? It, it does not listen to us sometimes, and it takes the space it needs. And it does it again and again. And in 2013, Colorado had record flooding. We, we had five inch, or um, in five days of rain, we had an annual amount of rain falling within the state, most of it occurring within two days. My basement personally flooded. <laughs> and you can see here, because we, did, we don't have that riparian zone, we didn't give it the space in a lot of these roadway corridors, 500 miles of road were wiped out. City, entire cities lost access um, to critical infrastructure, you know, food deliveries, et cetera, right? 
And so we started looking at, when we looked at repairing some of these roadway corridors, we looked at this. What does a natural system look like? What, what is this natural channel design with a low flow bank full and riparian zone look like? And how can we try to accommodate that within our designs, right? Because this provides a lot of different things. Vegetation on the bank. Stream bank erosion rates are reduced because of this natural vegetation buffer that's on the side. You've got floodplain activation and access within these zones. Obviously, aquatic preservation during drought flows because of that base flow, water comes back out of the riparian zone and feeds the low flow period. And you also have, during this low flow period, sediment transport. A lot of people don't realize a lot of sediment transport in streams occurs within the low flow channel, even during low flow events. So it's not a one size fits all as far as moving the natural sediment within that system. You got energy dissipation, right? As you spread water out, you slow it down, and then you've got all this roughness with the trees and vegetation that helps slow it down. Um, and then there's obviously the ancillary benefits, recreational opportunities, it's aesthetically pleasing, habitat, etc. Right? It's because stream banks are not rigid systems. That's why this bioengineering concept that you hear a lot has come about, is because we're trying to mimic what naturally occurs within these systems and how this vegetation performs so that we can then integrate it into projects. But I understand not every project can rely on the roots of a tree for stability. We have to have some of that hard engineering component. And that's what we did here. This was County for Road 43 is an example project from the floods. Um, initial damage estimates, we had five miles of road that were completely wiped out. Another three and a half miles that were heavy damage, and then another one and a half miles that were moderately damaged. And the original estimates were it's going to take $100 million to rebuild, and it's going to take three to five years. Well, by looking at the way we did this approach, we did it in $50 million in two years. So there's a, there's a benefit as well from the cost saving side, and then some just other statistics. It had 250,000 cubic yards of material generation on site, uh, which we used to actually construct 50,000 cubic yards of the riprap for the project, as well as 11 bridges during that time period. So here's the concept we came up with. So you've got, you'll see on the right side it says existing ground. That was the natural profile of the existing stream bank in this mountain canyon. And we said, okay, the river needs more room. This, road was built in the 30s and 40s, and they put it on the flat riparian zone because it was the easy spot to build it. But we have new techniques and we have, you know, large heavy machinery that we can do it a different way. So we said, all right, let's, we can chisel into that hillside, one, because it generates all the material that we need to construct this road. We generated all the riprap that you would need, class eight riprap actually on this project, so it was significant size. And we generated it on site, so we had no haul costs, right? All the trees that we brought down from that hillside, we used as root-wide stream revetments, and as well as other scour mitigation in the bioengineering side, soft side of the channel. And we gave that stream the width that we gained from the hillside. So the road now sits on bedrock, because we chiseled a bedrock platform. The excess rock and wood that would be waste were utilized on site. So here's an example, right? So it's a mountain corridor, and here's the pre-flood stream. And you'll see this nice hairpin is being turned by the, by the road. The existing road was the only thing that would turn that water during a flow event. Well, this is the same river that carved this canyon, and so it carved our roadway corridor. This is what it looked like pre-flood. You could jump across it, but during flood flows, it was 10,000 CFS, and it wiped everything out in this path, right? So this is what it looked like post-flood. You had this huge destroyed roadway system, and we could have just put, it back, put the road right back where it is, put more rock, more engineering, but where were we going to get that material from first? And is that the best place to, for the road to be in that canyon? First and foremost, this is a river corridor. The road is something that we need, so we looked and our design, you can see here, here's our roadway design we came up with because the lowest shear stresses within a river 
are on the inside bend. So we said, all right, let's put that road on the inside bend everywhere we can, and we'll let the mountain turn the river. And so that's what we did. And I've got some example photos here. So this is that same location. This is pre-flood, what it looked like. Post-flood, after they had patched in a road, this is what it looked like post-reconstruction. We put the road into the hillside, elevated it, and underneath that roadway embankment is a partially grouted Class 8 riprap, hard-engineered structure, but we also have the soft engineering, bioengineering, and expanded floodplain capacity at the same time. And we save money doing it, right? So you can satisfy those engineering needs that you have while still accomplishing an, a restoration style project. So right here's that road. You can see the, the rock scar from the cutting. And this large expanded floodplain where the river turns against the mountain. Right, so this is earlier this year after some vegetation coming in and we've got uh, tree riparian species planted within here. So in 10 years it's gonna be dramatically different with these large woody cottonwoods and willows, et cetera, on, along the bank, even further pr providing stability. And then we looked at the bridges themselves. We had 11 bridges, like I said. We wanted to have a multi-stage bridge design that accommodated a low flow, a bank full, and some floodplain capacity. Within reason, obviously, we had, we're in a mountain corridor, and we were limited by the girder length that we could actually fit within this canyon. Right, so here's the, an example bridge that we came up with. And another important note is one of every of the one of every of the bridge's abutments is actually protected by a bedrock feature. So one one abutment is tucked integrated with a bedrock feature to provide stability on that at least one side. But a lot of people don't deal with the project design side, so that's where the construction side. And this is also a critically important component of stormwater but they both tie together, right? So you have this construction side where you're looking at managing your site. Well, 35 to 45 tons of soil can wash off of a one acre construction site that's unmanaged in a, in, in a year. That's a dramatic loss, especially when soil is a resource that we, we have to preserve and protect. We grow our food in soil. We have to manage that resource just like we manage water resources. And, all of that soil goes somewhere. It fills in our streams and our receiving waters, right? So this is what no one wants to see, especially when you have an inspector out there on a construction site. That's not what we want, right? So this is take you back to County Road 43. We reconstructed the road where the river was and put the river where the road was. That was not easy, I can tell you. We had to do a lot of management on the site here. We have a riprap channel flowing between two roads mid-construction. It was very difficult to do, but you have to realize this is a post-flood event. It is, you have to strike while the iron's hot, as they say, right? And um, so when you look at your site, you have to look at, okay, what are, we, what are we doing in this job? What are our sediment generating activities? And here's a list of the standard sediment generating activities that occur within your transportation construction job, right? So clearing and grubbing, demolition, grading operations, obviously importing of soil, all of these activities, right? So that's where your sediment's coming from. And then you say, okay, what pollutants are we bringing on site? So we have all the fuels and grease and petroleum and all of that fun stuff. And then all of the compounds that we're actually using on the project itself. And then we have waste, all the waste that we're managing from the site as well. Right, so we, we have used fuel now. We have used um, solvents. We have demolition debris that we have to manage and dispose of appropriately. And so this is what the construction general permit was intended to encapsulate. It wants you to develop a plan. And that's the stormwater pollution prevention plan. And it has a narrative component and it has a site plan component. And that's all it's telling you to do. Look at your site, tell us what you're planning on doing, and how are you managing it, and then what kind of contingency measures, measures do you have if it doesn't work according to plan? Because it's the real world out there, things happen in the field, and you have to be able to respond. You don't want pollution just washing downstream when you're saying, well, the plan said we're gonna do this. You gotta change the plan, and you gotta adapt to your site, right? 
And so that's what the SWIFT is. We lay it out, we identify these critical areas, and we work through the plan and manage the plan accordingly. But we also don't rely on one single BMP on a site. You want to make sure there's redundancy in your system, right? So that, that's where you hear the term treatment train. And the treatment train, here's an example of a treatment train approach, right? So surface roughening. So you're doing a cut slope, surface roughening reduces erosion by 52% just by track walking the slope with construction equipment, right? So you track walk it, you then break that slope so it has less volume and velocity before it hits a break through waddles or some other BMP. Then we apply a surface seeding and mulch. And then we finally put a sediment control at the bottom. That is a treatment train layered construction cut slope. And that's what you want to look at. You, you're not relying on one single BMP to protect that slope. You're layering it in there so that even if erosion does occur, you've got that sediment barrier at the bottom. Because we're starting with erosion control and then managing sediment. So as you go through this process, you're looking at your project and you're saying, okay, what opportunities and constraints do we have on this project? What can we do within reason based on our project needs? You go through and you consider your site and surroundings and all of those aspects in your design, and then you put it into play. You have the construction side of things, and it's important to document your challenges and successes within that and feed that back into the next project that you work on because there's lessons learned that everyone should be sharing through this process on things that didn't work, BMPs that aren't good for certain scenarios, et cetera, that you can continually improve upon. Right? And compliance isn't easy. I work for... So CFL is a cradle-to-grave delivery organization, much like a DOT. So we actually plan, design, and oversee construction of projects. Um, and so I brought forward a few of the things that we, we struggle with sometimes, right? So sometimes the need of a project, you can't avoid a certain impact. So you're having to mitigate off-site um, or, or construct mitigation within your project, like the 43 job, right? You're only doing a minor shoulder widening of one foot, so how can we incorporate impervious treatment for that new facility with that minor widening within this existing narrow footprint? Right? And then there's construction. You know, obviously, funding is always an issue for un unknowns. BMP failures in responding. Um, contractors not keeping up with paperwork or even site conditions. And, uh, Contractor wants to build the job, build, build the road, right? They don't want to worry about BMPs. It's typically a smaller line item within their funds for the project. And so they're like, why is it worth my while, right? And so you have to figure out contractual me mechanisms to make them care. Typically, it's in the pocketbook, but, <laughs> um, right? But the benefits that come out of this integrated approach, you can protect and restore aquatic ecosystems so that they can do the work that they normally do and pr improve water quality adjacent to your job so you have less work to do in the long run. Um, you have improved water quality in receiving waters. Obviously, conservation of your water resources as you restore these natural systems. Um, and then protection of public health and flood control are important benefits. So. I wish everyone the best uh, on their projects, um, whatever role you have. And um, I don't know if there was.